is attorney Elise Gross with the Presser Law Firm. Today's webinar is going to be on the tax law changes for 2019. Before we get started, if you get disconnected, please call into our office, 561-953-1050. If you have any questions during the course of the webinar, you can type them in the chat box and I'll try to get to them. If you're not already receiving our weekly newsletter, please write into info at assetprotectionattorneys.com and we'll make sure to get you on the newsletter. And we do webinars every month. We switch off between estate planning and asset protection topics. So feel free to just kind of tune into our newsletter and it'll let you know when the next webinars are. So what I wanted to go over today is just really an overview of where tax laws are right now. As I'm sure in there were some major changes. And in 2019, certain other ones have shifted over. So we're going to kind of go over really just a, an overview. If you have any additional questions, feel free to you know, email in and we can handle them at another time. So I wanted to show you that just starting from the income tax standpoint, the income tax rates for 2018 standardized deductions were minutely changed from 18 to 19. It was only changed by a few hundred dollars. And the reason behind the high standardized deduction now, because if you look at the change between 2017 and 2018, it nearly doubled. The reason for this is that the IRS is trying to stay away from having people itemize their deductions. So that's why they raised the standardized deduction with the hope that the majority of people will use the standardized deduction. With that in mind, the itemized deductions haven't really changed from 18 to 19, with the exception of medical expenses. Starting in 2019, you can only deduct the amount of total unreimbursed allowable medical care expenses for that year that exceeds 10% of adjusted gross income. And adjusted gross income is the total income that's subject to tax. So that includes bonuses and W-2 income and uh, used to include um, a bunch of other things. I can't, sorry, drawing a blank now. Um, minus itemized deductions, certain itemized deductions and personal exemptions. So that would include like IRA contributions, and if you're an educator, certain expenses related to um, your being an educator, certain supplies and tuitions and things of that nature. So we're really trying to get away from, so allegedly I would guess the complications, although I really don't think the IRS will ever get away from complications, but the goal is to go with the standardized deductions, if your home is a very expensive home, you do not have the same ability to deduct the full mortgage interest anymore. You can't deduct home equity loan interest. So we've definitely lost a lot of the deductions, but that is one of the reasons they compensated by nearly doubling the standardized deduction. I'm not going to really go into much about the alternative minimum tax, but it's basically an alternative method of calculating the tax. For high income earners, the exemptions have gone up extremely minutely. So it went up for a single individual from 70,300 to 71,700 and only about $2,000 for a married couple. So they haven't really gone up very much and not many people are really subject to this, but if you are, you have to make sure that you are calculating under the alternative tax. Now, 529 plans, those are the plans that are used for education. So the new thing is that if a beneficiary gets a refund, you have 60 days to recontribute that amount. So for instance, if you're going to college and you pay for a course, but then you drop it, normally that might be considered income because now you're going to get a refund. However, if you recontribute that amount back into the 529 plan to be used again for qualified medical, for qualified educational expenses, then it won't be considered a taxable event. 
In addition, what a lot of people don't know is you can use the 529 plan minimally for um, secondary and primary education before college. So for kindergarten through 12th grade, you can use up to 10,000 per individual to pay for um, tuition for private schools. And lastly, um, if you're interested, and this is really a subject for another time, if you have someone in your family who's under age 26 who has disabilities, there's a type of account called an ABLE account that can be set up, and 529s can potentially be rolled into the ABLE account for the benefit of that qualified person with disabilities. Some changes that we've seen in companies. So the C Corp, and this changed last year, which used to be taxed at a high level. So now C Corps are taxed at a much lower level of 21%. This took away some of the downside of having a C Corp. So I think we're going to start seeing some more of those when we had seen a major drop in them when the corporate tax rates were so high. For entities that we call pass-through entities like S corporations or LLCs or even LLCs taxed as S corporations, partnerships and sole proprietorships, meaning they pass through taxation to the individual owners rather than pay on both a corporate level and on an individual owner level, like with the C Corp. With the pass-throughs, the old law was income tax was just straight passed through to the individual owners and it had a high rate of a highest rate of 39.6 but now the way it's working is you can claim a 20 percent deduction on the first 315,000 of the income if you're joint or 157,000 if you're an individual filer and then um sorry that should say 20 percent the 20 percent deduction applies to all the business profits. So essentially what they're doing is they're lowering the effective tax rate here, almost 10%. So there's some a lot of benefits now for entities, and it really is kind of a toss-up as to whether or not C-Corp, S-Corp, LLC, partnership, you have to look at all factors involved in what the company is doing, who the owners are, what your goals are, your goals asset protection, or your goals estate planning, or your goals tax savings, deductions, things of that nature. So entity classification is really going to take a surge now in importance when people are deciding what kind of business they want to yeah. start. So the gift tax is the tax that you pay by giving a gift and you either have to pay the tax or it's an exemption and you don't have to pay it, but it comes off of a federal tax exemption. The annual exclusion is the exclusion that you get from certain gifts that are made. Somebody just typed the sound is off again. I apologize. I don't understand what's happening here. So if somebody can just tell me if they're hearing me. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, okay, so gift tax, if, you, if I give somebody a gift during life, then there's a potential tax on it. So here's how it works. I have a certain amount of money that I'm allowed to give between my death and my life, of which there'll be no tax. So there's an exemption amount. That exemption amount, I'm going to slip skip to that slide for a moment. That exemption amount currently is $11.4 million per individual. That means I can either choose to give that amount during my life, leave that in my estate when I die, or a combination thereof. Sorry, I'm going back up now. Okay, so if I want to give a gift of a million dollars, then I can give a gift of a million dollars to any individual or any group of individuals, but I have to declare that to the IRS on a gift tax return, and the IRS is going to ask me the question as to whether or not that is a present interest gift or whether it's a future interest gift. 
If it's a present interest gift, that means that whoever is receiving it is getting the benefit of the use today. And if it's a future interest gift, then it's a gift that they are going to get in the future. The reason that's important is that the IRS gives a $15,000 per person per year exclusion on a gift if it's for a present interest gift. So if I give you a check for a million dollars, you will then cash the check. That's considered a present interest. I've given it to you now. You can benefit from it today. I let the IRS know that I've given a million dollars, but I get a $15,000 deduction or exclusion from the total gift. So my gift would be a million less 15,000. Now, if I took that same million and I gave, I split it between five different people, then I would have five times 15,000 as an exclusion because I get it per individual the balance that is not under that exclusion becomes what is called a taxable gift. I'm not going to pay any money on that gift. I'm not going to pay any tax. What I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce my $11.4 million exemption, federal exemption, by the gift, the taxable gift. So I'm going to deduct the million minus the 15000 per person. And whatever that net amount is, I deduct that from my 11.4. So no money was changed hands with the IRS, but I've declared it. And now the IRS knows that when I die, I have that much less of an exemption to be used. The 15,000 per year has not changed from 2014 to 2015. If you look at the way that annual exclusion has gone up, it really has not climbed very much. I started practicing back in about 1992, and it was $10,000. We're now many years later, decades later, and we're only up to $15,000. I've heard no talk about raising it any more than that. And based on the way they've been raising it, if they do raise it, it's you know maybe going to raise every few years by $1,000. It's not that much of a difference. However, if you're making gifts... If you spread it through many people, then each one of them is entitled to an exclusion. The estate tax is what happens upon your death. Any assets that you own anywhere in the world are valued and calculated as what your estate is worth, what your gross estate is worth. After you make certain deductions for certain expenses and things of that nature, you're going to come up with your net taxable estate. That net taxable estate uh, is then looked at in comparison to whatever that exemption that you have left is. So I told you there's an $11.4 million exemption currently per individual, minus any taxable gifts that you've already given. And that, that net amount is what you have left to give at your death tax-free. After that, you're going to be taxed from an estate tax level. Here's how the exemption has gone up. So we started in the early 1900s, it was only $50,000. When I first started practicing in the early 90s, it was only $600,000. Today we're at $11.4 million. Based on the current tax law, it's set to sunset in the year 2025, meaning in 2026, new tax rates are going to apply. If all continues as it's supposed to be and no changes are made by, the, by Congress, it will sunset back down to 5 million plus inflation, which will come out somewhere around six, six and a half million dollars. No one has any idea whether or not that's actually going to happen, but if no law is changed, then that is what is going to happen. The good news is that I just recently saw in the late 2018, the IRS regulations have come out to say that if they do drop that exemption amount back down, anyone who has used the full exemption, meaning the 11.4 or whatever it is, as it raises each year, they're not going to claw back that extra amount. Meaning if you gave away 11.4 and it drops, the exemption drops down to half of that, 
you will not be retroactively taxed on the difference between the 11.4 and the lower amount. So that happens to be great news because I know a lot of people were worried about that. It makes it a little bit challenging when you're an estate planning attorney to plan for these things when you really don't know what is going to happen in the end. We only know what's projected and we just have to be extremely flexible with our planning. But it also means that you as a individual, once you do your planning, you need to make sure that you're following up with your estate planning attorney you know, every couple of years, and certainly in 2025, 2026, to make sure that your estate plan meshes with the current tax law. Because there can, if that exemption does drop back down, it could mean a significance to a lot of people. The tax rate itself is basically at 40%. Once you hit a million dollars, you're at the cap rate, which is 40%. And if you see, it's kind of gone up and down over the years. In 1987, if you died then, your tax rate was 55% and, your, and the exemption was only $600,000. So you can only imagine there were an enormous amount of taxable estates in those days. They've come upon a much more reasonable amount now. The exemption is quite high. So the number of taxable estates is definitely going to be much lower. And if you do have a taxable estate, the amount that's taxable is going to be capped at 40%, which is still a high amount, but it's a lot less than 77% or 55%. The good news is when you're married, the exemption doesn't even have to be used for anything that you give for your spouse, as long as your spouse is a citizen. So if I'm married and I want to leave all of my assets to my husband, I can do that. And there's no tax, there's no estate tax on that. However, when my husband dies, all the assets that I've given him will now potentially be taxable in his estate if he hasn't used them up. So the marital deduction, essentially the concept behind it is to allow for spouses to exchange gifts with no tax consequences and for a surviving spouse to be able to utilize all of the assets of the deceased spouse. And then it's on the family after both spouses have died for the estate tax to be calculated. What they came up with in 2000 and I believe it was 2010 or 2012 is a concept called portability. And the way portability works is in the olden days, meaning prior to that time, if you didn't use your individual exemption, meaning you left everything to your spouse and therefore it's a marital deduction, there's no tax, you lost your exemption, it couldn't be applied anymore. Portability allows for a surviving spouse to use the leftover exemption of the deceased spouse. So it allows for much more flexible estate planning. There are some pitfalls to that. Um, kind of beyond today's scope, but you have to kind of look at if somebody remarry, if the surviving spouse remarries, that can have an impact on that portability. So anyone who falls into that category and has a leftover exemption should definitely consult with an estate planning attorney, an estate tax attorney, before they get remarried to find out what they need to do in order to take advantage as much as possible of the concept of portability, because there's definitely a way to do it, but it involves some gifting and you need to be aware of it. Whether you do it or not is another story, but you certainly need to be aware of it. Now, I mentioned the citizen spouse because if your spouse is not a citizen, then there is no unlimited marital deduction, meaning with the exception of doing things in a certain way, Husbands and wives cannot pass things between each other with no tax consequence, gift, or estate um, if the recipient spouse is a non-U.S. citizen. The way that it works for a non-citizen is there's a cap amount that you can give under a marital deduction, meaning no estate or gift tax, of $155,000. Now that's an annual amount as well, so it goes for whether it's a gift during life or it's in an estate. 
But if you think about it, if your spouse is a non-U.S. citizen, when you die, if you just do things with no planning, the only amount that's exempt from taxation for marital deduction is $155,000. That means you have to use your federal exemption, your $11.4 million or whatever it is at the time, adjusted for inflation, against whatever you're leaving for your spouse, which you would normally not have to do. So it does require, if your assets are significant, it does require some very careful planning when your spouse is a non-U.S. citizen. There are, there's a certain type of trust called a QDOT, a qualified domestic trust that can be used, but there are some very strict rules for it. So you have to be aware of them. There are some post-mortem or after-death planning that can be done with the QDOT, but again, it's extremely restrictive so you want to make sure that you know what the ramifications of all this are going in. Generation skipping transfer tax. So in addition to the estate and the gift tax, there's something called a generation skipping transfer tax, which means if you give money or leave money at death to a generation that is more than one generation below you, like a grandchild or great-grandchildren, there is an additional tax that's tacked on. So the good news is there is an exemption, and the exemption will save certain amounts from being taxed, but it does not safeguard all of the assets. So when you're planning, you need to make sure that you're doing what we'll call the exempt trust and non-exempt trust. You want to take, take essential care to maximize whatever is being put into an exempt trust for the benefit of a generation below your children. So a lot of people do legacy planning and do trusts, especially in a state like Florida, where a trust can continue for 360 years. That's great because the money can continue to be used for multiple generations. But when you do that, if your assets are significant enough, you really have to take care with the generation skipping tax planning. Because if not, the trust can be subject to multiple taxes. I mentioned New York only because New York has a very interesting law when it comes to estate tax. So some states have an, have an estate tax on the state level, and some states do not, like Florida, and we only have the federal level. So in states like New York, where you have a tax on the state level, you have to look at what the local tax laws are, meaning what are the New York tax rules. So even though a New Yorker is subject to the $11.4 million exemption from federal tax, their New York tax only has a $5.74 million exemption, which is not bad. The problem is, for whatever reason they've structured it, that if your estate exceeds that 5.74 by 5% or more, you now have no exemption from New York. You only have the federal against federal exemption. So I'm not really sure what the legislative reasoning was behind that one. That is going to affect many, many people, but that's just their rule. So I only pointed it out because it is a bit unusual. Last thing I want to cover is charitable giving. So if you gift money to a 501c3 qualified public charity, then you're entitled to a deduction. The old law was that you were entitled to deduct up to 50% of your adjusted gross income and if you were gifting cash. And if you're gifting appreciated property, then it's only 30%. They raised the cash gift to 60%. So that's actually really good. That's a nice change. Charitable gifts, you can give during life or you can give them at death. There's a lot of different vehicles that can be used so that it's not just, let me write a check and it's one and done. There, If you put it in trust, there are ways to structure it so your legacy can continue on. You can 
um, have your, you know, many generations involved in a charitable organization of which they can not benefit directly from in terms of if it's a charity, the charity's receiving the money, but they might be, you know, on the board and paid board members. There's definitely ways to structure it to take full advantage of both the tax exemptions from a charitable standpoint, as well as legacy planning and fostering, you know, community service for your family members and for your descendants. 2019, the other thing that they've done and this is significant is there's no longer a penalty for um, not being part of the Affordable Care for the Affordable Care Act for not having the health insurance. That was a big issue for companies. Um, and alimony, this one is pretty big. Alimony used to be deductible by the spouse who paid it, and it was taxable to the spouse receiving it. It is no longer as of 2019 for divorces from January 2019 forward. It's still retroactive for any, any final divorce decree prior to 2019. But moving forward, it is no long, alimony is no longer deductible to the person paying it, and it is no longer income to the spouse receiving it. So if you, it's a little too late now to plan, but there were certainly a lot of people who were planning around this in 2018. Now we're going to see how the new rules work out. I guess for the IRS, they're looking at it as a wash. Um, I think it's going to restructure how people structure their marital settlement agreements. Things won't be called alimony anymore. I know the spouse who would be receiving alimony would want it to be called alimony, and the one giving it will not want it to be called alimony. So I don't know how people are going to be structuring that, but we'll have to wait and see how that pans out. There were no changes on step up in basis, which means if you inherit something, the estate, the value of it upon death becomes the new cost basis to the recipients. Portability, as I discussed, didn't change. It's still around. That's for marital deduction, rolling over an, an unused, I mean, rolling over an unused federal exemption to the surviving spouse. And lastly, valuation discounts have not changed. There was supposed to be a major change on that in 2016. It did not happen when the Trump administration came in. So we do not know what's going to happen with that. And essentially what that is, is certain assets like limited partnerships, um, small businesses, things of that nature, when they're passed on either by gift or estate, are entitled to a discounted value for tax purposes. So far, so good on those. Those are very useful, but we don't know when and if that will change. So bear that in mind if you have a closely held company or a limited partnership to decide whether or not you want to gift that while the discount rules are still in effect. Our next webinar is on February 21st. It'll be on fraudulent transfers. So if you're interested in that, that's our asset protection webinar. Please feel free to join in. And don't forget, if you're not already receiving our newsletter, please email in at info at assetprotectionattorneys.com. And we'll be happy to get you on that. In addition, if you have any questions on today's webinar or anything having to do with estate planning or asset protection, feel free to contact our office and get a complimentary preliminary consultation. Thank you so much and have a great rest of the day.